With 37 killers currently in DVD, there's a lot of lore for each to read through, but who wants to read? This series will discuss the killer's lore and audiobook type form, so you can listen while doing some other task. This episode will be going over four killers, Myers, Hag, Doctor, and Huntress. Let's begin with... Some humans are simply bad seeds. Seeds infused with a distilled and pure form of evil. Michael Myers is one of those seeds. He had no issues with causing the pain of others. Instead, it was exactly what he sought. But even life can be tough on those with minds filled with terror. The difference is just how one goes about to solve those problems. For Michael, he had to kill to find some inner peace. As he took his sister's life, the police found a silent boy dressed as a clown at the scene. When one stumbles upon a growing fire, one does not pour gasoline on it. But this was an action taken by officials that had no idea how it would shape this demon in the boy's body. Sending Michael to a mental institution was a feeble attempt to save the child. Unsuccessful therapy and nightly screams just made him even more introverted and deranged. People hoped that Michael Myers would end up a parenthesis, soon to be forgotten and buried. A failure that soon were to rot away. But then, he escaped. Lisa Sherwood grew up in a quiet village, mainly isolated from the rest of civilization. The people of the hamlet were kind, and the elders kept old traditions alive often keeping the peace by personally setting the ever-rare disputes. Lisa was particularly fond of the charms they taught her to draw for safety and good fortune. One night, as she was walking home through the woods, a terrible storm struck without warning. Howling winds whipped at her hair as she stumbled through the swamp, her rain-drenched dress plastered to her skin. In the slick, wet mud, she lost her footing, careening backward and striking her head against rock. Slipping in and out of consciousness, she strained to identify the dark shapes approaching her from between the trees. That's the last thing she could remember. Her kidnappers kept her chained to the wall in a flooded cellar. Though dimly lit, she could see others whose large open wounds swarmed with flies. It took merely a day before they returned, carving chunks from the prisoners' bodies with rusted blades, consuming their very flesh down to the bone. Most she saw did not survive long once the cannibals targeted them, but somehow, deep within, Lisa persisted. Starved, infected, and mutilated after several weeks of torture, her gaunt arms became loose in their shackles. She pulled hard, the metal tearing through skin and muscle until she was free. Her flesh oozed viscous yellow pus, and bones were visible beneath gangrenous wounds. She could go no further. Delirious, she thought of her home. She thought of the elders. With her dying breath, she etched the symbols they had taught her into the floor, using what remained of her fingers. Almost in response, a dark hunger stirred inside her. It yearned for blood. An oath, she chose vengeance. The village's search parties eventually brought them to an old shack in a swamp. Inside, its previous inhabitants had been viciously dismembered and devoured by an unidentifiable animal. In the cellar amid rotting corpses and disconnected flesh, the elders' charms were scald in the blood on the floor. Lisa's body was not among the bodies and was never found. The village was never the same again. Showing exceptional aptitude in psychology, Herman was handpicked for special training in an advanced neuroscience program located in a secret black site facility in Illinois known as Larry's Memorial Institute, really a front for the CIA. This is where Herman met Dr. Otto Stamper, where under his guidance, Herman began to use strange and ever-increasingly vicious methods to extract information from prisoners sent to the Institute, which was also a covert prison and re-education center for whoever was the USA's current nemesis. His liberal use of violent electroshock therapy revealed dramatic results and several threats to national security were uncovered. Over the years, Herman became known as the Doctor, and no one ever questioned if he had ever even had a medical certificate or even what had happened to the prisoners after they'd given up their information. It was only after Larry's Memorial Institute went silent for a week that a true horror was finally discovered. The personnel, patients, and prisoners were all found dead, with all types of head trauma. All personnel and prisoners' bodies were accounted for, including Dr. Stamper, but no sign of Herman, the Dr. Carter. It is important to note that this is not how the Doctor's lore was originally presented. However, this is what is in-game now, and therefore canon. As soon as Anna was able to walk, her mother started teaching her how to survive a harsh, solitary life in the northern woods. Living in such an extremely remote and dangerous area required skill and resilience. When sunlight became too dim for productive activities, they would take refuge in their house, a sturdy old cabin constructed to resist the toughest winters. Close to the hearth of warmth, Anna would rest in her mother's arms, surrounded by the few wooden toys and masks she had crafted for her. Drifting off the sleep with stories and lullabies, she dreamt happy dreams, ignorant of the events that would soon change everything. Anna and her mother were stalking great elk through the woods. They knew it was dangerous prey but it had been a particularly difficult winter, and they were almost out of food. 
The specter of starvation frightened them more than any forest creature. Without warning, the elk reared, bellowed, and charged at Anna. She was paralyzed with fear, as the whole world seemed to shake under the immense beast pounding hooves. The elk was close enough for Anna to see the murderous fury in its eyes when her mother threw herself in its path, axe in hand. A blood-curdling scream escaped from her lips as the elk impaled her upon its antlers and hoisted her into the air. With all their strength, she brought the axe down on its head again and again while it tried to shake her loose. With a sickening crack, the antlers snapped and Anna's mother was free. The beast collapsed. Anna was too small to move her mother's broken body, so she sat with her in the clearing where she had fallen. To distract her from the dying elk's cries, Anna's mother held her and hummed her favorite lullaby. They stayed like that, the huntress and the elk getting quieter and colder, till Anna was alone in the silent forest. Eventually, she stood up and started the long walk back home. Still a child, she knew just enough about life in the frozen forest to survive. She followed her instincts and became one with the wild. She got older and stronger and practiced her hunt. As she grew into a dangerous predator, her humanity became a half-remembered dream. She widened her territory and lived off her hunts. She worked her way up through squirrels, hares, mink, and foxes. Eventually, she grew tired of them and hunted more dangerous animals, like wolves and bears. When unsuspecting travelers came through her woods, she discovered her new favorite prey, humans. Unlucky souls who strayed into her territory were slaughtered like any other animal. She liked to collect their tools and colorful garments, and especially toys when they were little ones, but she could never bring herself to kill the little girls. Girls she would take back to her house, deep in the woods. They were precious, and looking at them woke up something deep in her own heart. She craved the closeness of a loved one, and a child of her own. Among the pillaged wooden toys, dolls, and storybooks she couldn't read, the girls would be tied by the neck with a rough and chafing rope fastened firmly to the wall. She couldn't let them wander off, or they would surely die outside. Every time, the girls would waste away and die of cold, or starvation, or sickness. Every time it plunged Anna deeper into pain, and sorrow, and madness. She was compelled to try again, and started raiding the nearest villages to slaughter families and kidnap their daughters. She wore one of the animal masks her mother crafted her so many years earlier to try to calm the frightened children. Villagers spread the legend of a half-beast lurking in the Red Forest, the Huntress, who killed men and eight little girls. War eventually came to the forest. German soldiers began to pass through on the march to attack the collapsing Russian Empire. During these dark times, there were no more travelers. The villagers had abandoned their homes and no more little ones to be found, only soldiers. Many of them were found with violent axe wounds. Whole groups disappeared mysteriously. Once the war was over, the rumors of the Huntress disappeared with it, engulfed by the Red Forest. That's the end of this episode. I know this one was shorter, but that's because these survivors don't have much lore. The next episode will definitely be longer. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.